Welcome back to the Hill Update. I am your host, Dean Allison, Member of Parliament for Niagara West. Big news out of Ottawa. Even though Parliament will not meet until the second last week of November, on Tuesday, the Board of Internal Economy, a powerful parliamentary committee, ordered that anyone entering the House of Commons precinct, including all members of Parliament, will need to be fully vaccinated as of November 22nd. The debate and the decision took place behind closed doors. This committee has a membership of nine MPs, of which five are Liberals, one is an NDP, one is Bloc, and two are Conservatives. Under the Parliament of Canada Act, the Board of Internal Economy is responsible for financial and administrative matters that concern the House of Commons. Decisions are normally by consensus, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. According to the committee, there will be limited exceptions offered for medical valid reasons, with the requirement to show proof of a recent negative antigen test. The parliamentary precinct vaccine mandate is happening despite the time-honored tradition of parliamentary privilege, which until this day has virtually never been prevented any members of parliament from accessing their office or the House of Commons, where they faithfully represent their constituents. The Conservative Party is the only party that is opposing this order. Their stance is the same as it was during the election, that everyone who is able and chooses to get vaccinated should do so. And for those remaining, rapid tests should be made available to keep everyone safe. Blake Richards, in his role as the Conservative Party Whip in Parliament, said this about the order. We encourage everyone who can be vaccinated to get vaccinated. However, we cannot agree to seven MPs meeting in secret, deciding which of the 338 MPs just elected by the Canadians can enter the House of Commons to represent their constituents. Richards went on to say, I can't discuss what happens at an in-camera meeting, but I will say that we've always said that vaccines are the most important tool to get us out of this pandemic. As we said during the election, workplace health and safety can be assured through vaccination or through the demonstration of a recent negative rapid test results. His comments suggest that the Board of Internal Economy's decision was most likely approved by the Liberals, New Democrats, and Bloc Québécois without the support of the Conservatives. John Iveson, a prominent journalist for the National Post, asked, are MPs really comfortable that the body set up to handle human resource and administrative matters has bypassed the constitutional role of the House and made a consequential decision on its behalf? This all seems quite peculiar. Are members of Parliament playing political games with each other's vaccination status? Are we entering an era of vaccine politics where one side bans the other based on medical status? Is this the case for the Liberals, the Bloc, and the NDP banning some Conservative members? If some Conservative MPs are barred from entry into the House of Commons, and that's if they can get to Ottawa with the current travel restrictions, including the vaccine mandate for travellers, it is unclear how the rights of their constituents will be heard and will be respected. When did it become okay in our society to ban members of parliament from the workplace, or anyone else for that matter, based on their personal medical choices? Steve Chaplin, former legal counsel for the House of Commons for 15 years, said that the only body that can determine whether MPs should enjoy unimpeded access is the entire House itself. Chaplin also said that there is no business in jurisdiction for the Board of Eternal Economy to interfere with the proceedings in the House, including members, attendance, and participation. Privileges are constitutional and, at the end of the day, the independence of the House to carry out its functions and how this is done is for the House to decide. John Iveson said this about the order. What the Liberal-dominated Board does not do is make decisions on fundamental constitutional questions. Yet, that is what is just done. Iveson goes on to say there are strong feelings, even among MPs who are vaccinated, that mandatory vaccination is an infringement on freedom of movement and the constitutional rights of Canadians, and that it is equally clear that the board has no jurisdiction when it comes to MPs whose privilege to fulfill their parliamentary duties is a constitutional matter. Parliament must remain able to represent the interest of all Canadians. This includes those who are fully vaccinated, those who are medically exempt, and those who have opted not to get the COVID-19 vaccine for various personal reasons at this time. When we come back, we're going to introduce our couple guests, and today we're going to be talking about immunity, natural immunity in the body as it relates to COVID-19. 
when we come back from break. See you after the break. Welcome back to The Hill Update. Joining me on the show today are some world-leading experts in their chosen fields. We have Dr. Stephen Pellich and we have got Dr. Niall Carroll. Dr. Niall Carroll graduated with a PhD in bio biology, toxicology, immunology from the University of Waterloo and continued with a postdoctorate work at the University of Guelph and Virginia Commonwealth University in immunotoxicology, which is the study of the effects of toxic substances on the immune system, and immunogenics, which is the immune responses. Niall is currently a professor at the University of Guelph, where he's been for the last 19 years and teaches and does research in the areas of immunotoxicology and immunogenics. He has also published in over 186 publications that have been referenced by thousands. Dr. Stephen Pellich, is a graduate with his PhD in biochemistry from UBC and continued his work at the, in doctoral work at Scotland at the University of Dundee and at the Howard Hughes Medical Center at the University of Washington in Seattle. Dr. Pellich is a tenured professor at UBC. In addition, he started a pharmaceutical company in 1992 and in the, then in 1999, he founded uh, Conexus uh, Bioinformatics, which is a biotechnology company located in the Vancouver area. They provide information to companies and the academia. They measure, they track, they use biomarkers and antibodies, proteins, et cetera. And they've been able to provide that information to over 2,000 laboratories in over 14, 40 different countries. Dr. Pellich has authored over 230 scientific publications in peer-reviewed journals. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. I wanted to give people a brief intro, but could you guys also talk about some of the things you're working on right now uh, in terms of what you're doing either at work or your what, you, what types of research things you guys are involved with? Sure, I, I can start off. Sure. Um, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate being here and the opportunity to speak to your audience. Uh, in my lab at Conexus, uh, we've been working on developing tests to determine whether or not people have antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And people who recover from COVID, they almost they all have antibodies. And our objective was to develop a very sensitive test. So we've been working on this for about 17 months. And also in my lab, we've been working on uh, understanding drugs that could interfere with the replication of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but infects human cells. And We've actually uncovered some very interesting compounds that uh, look very promising. So that's sort of my COVID-related research. Thank you. That's great. And so when you do, do people send, obviously then people send information into you and you guys can uh, look at that stuff and get the information back to people? Uh, basically what's happening is we develop tests where we take a few drops of blood and from that we obtain the clear serum portion and only about... Uh, 10 microliters, so this is a fraction of a teardrop amount, is all that we need to actually uh, investigate the levels of antibodies against the various proteins that are in the virus. There's actually 28 proteins in SARS-CoV-2 virus, and we're tracking uh, currently 10 of them. Perfect, great. Uh, Dr. Carroll, talk to us about some of the research you're doing these days. Yes, well, thank you for uh, inviting me today. It's nice to see you in the audience as well. Um, I have to pardon my home office here. Um, so my uh, area of research is, is focused on inflammation. And um, I, I li largely focus on livestock uh, inflammatory diseases. Um, but uh, part of that work that we do is related to inflammation during pregnancy and how that affects uh, fetal programming. So stress caused by an infection or um, something such as a adverse reaction to a vaccine might affect the uh, developing fetus so that um, we don't know what the outcome will be in the case of vaccination, but we do know with uh, large animal models that um, if you do trigger an inflammatory response in, in a pregnant animal, it does have long-term consequences on both the neuroendocrine and the immune development of the offspring. So that's one area. Another area is focused on um, immunotoxicology, as you mentioned. Uh, we do a lot of work with fungal um, mycotoxins, we call them. 
and uh, bacterial toxins, and again, how they trigger inflammation and how the host responds to them. And then the third area is really looking at genetics of how individual animals uh, respond to infection. And the intent is that we can breed animals to be more uh, resistant to certain types of diseases. That's great. Well, we, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some natural immunity. I, I think when we come back for break, let's walk through the process of explaining what natural immunity is to the uh, to the uh, people out out there watching, and then walk through why that's important as we move forward with what we're starting to find out about what's going on with COVID nineteen. So when we come back from the break, we're going to start talking about what natural immunity is and learn all about that when we come back. Welcome back to the Hill Update. Uh, so we're gonna talk about natural immunity. So immunity and uh, virology of uh, 101 have taught us that over the, a century that natural immunity will protect us against certain respiratory viruses. Even the CDC and Health Canada recognize that we have natural immunity for chicken pox, measles, mumps, and rubella. So let's talk a bit about that right now. Dr. Carroll, let's, you know, we the whole concept of natural immunity, what does it mean and why, how, how, do, how do we end up with natural immunity? Well, it's, it's something that uh, takes time, actually. Um, and uh, we, we are born um, immunologically naive. We are exposed to microbes from our mother and the surrounding environment, and our body learns to, um, to respond and to not respond to certain types of organisms. And this is all determined by two arms of the immune system, the innate immune system, which is when you're born, it's uh, fully and functional and the acquired immune system, which takes time to mature. So immunity is the ability to resist infection. And so, yes, we all are born with some level of immunity, um, but over time, our immunity gets better and then it reaches a threshold. As we get older, it starts to wane. So our immune system is not as functional or perhaps overreactive um, and may cause tissue damage. One of the components of the immune system that's relevant to uh, uh, COVID is the inflammatory response. That's an innate response that we're all born with. But as we get older, we have the uh, reduced ability to regulate it. And the problem with inflammation is it's like a double-edged sword. We need it to fight infection or to mount an immune response to a vaccine. But if there's too much of it, it can also cause tissue damage. So in terms of natural immunity, I mean, everyone builds this up over time, correct? Is this, this is what happens in our body naturally? Correct. That's right. And there's another component too. Um, there are certain organisms that share um, certain maybe proteins or carbohydrates on their surface. And so if you become resistant to one kind of pathogen, it's possible that you might become resistant or be resistant to another type of pathogen. An example to this would be, we know now that people who are exposed to SARS-1 um, and have recovered are more resistant and have antibodies that help to protect them against SARS-CoV-2. Very good. Uh, so my question is, as we move forward, uh, and we look at this, why is this important? So we talk about the fact that, you know, no one, no one actually doubts that you have natural immunity from mumps, measles. You don't need to be revaccinated every year. That, that happens or you get it as a child and then it's, it's, it's done. So why is that important in terms of as we look at natural immunity? Well, it's important because some of us in the population are perhaps even in asymptomatic. You've probably heard of that term. You are exposed to the uh, pathogen and might not even respond to it and your immune system is taking care of it and you don't even know about it. So that would be one element. A another one would be that um, um, in the case of elderly people where their immune system, their natural immune system is waning over time, um, they are obviously more sensitive. And that's why there's been a real push at the beginning of this pandemic to get the, the elderly and the immune compromised vaccinated. Great. Um, Dr. Pellet, do you want to add anything to that at all? Um, sure. I mean, the, with the immune system, it's like having an army, navy, and air force. And as Dr. Carroll's uh, commented, that the innate immune system is there right away early on and when you're younger. And then as you get exposed to more and more environmental pathogens, bacteria and viruses, you develop that, that adaptive immune response, which basically has T cells and B cells. And these lymphocytes, in the case of the B cells, uh, produce antibodies. 
And those antibodies, the levels of those antibodies will be elevated at the time that you're infected. But as the infection wanes, then what ends up happening is the individual, the cells, the B cells that produce the antibodies, they then um, basically go and hibernate. They, they go into a dormant state. They reside basically in your bone marrow. And then when you encounter the virus again, then they start growing and dividing. And then that line pumps out more antibodies and protects you. As, as Dr. Carroll says, even before you even know that you're infected, your body's effectively dealt with it. And the, the other arm, the T cells, these are cells that go out and seek. Basically, they've been adapted to recognize that virus or, or, or bacteria and uh, then take it out. So the issue really with, with aging is probably when you have a sedentary lifestyle, you're not getting exposed to a lot of these bacteria and viruses. So your, your immunity can naturally wane in the case of maybe um, even some of these uh, T and B cells. Welcome back to the Hill Update. Uh, what we were talking about before break, uh, doctor, was the whole concept of natural immunity, why it's important. You were talking about aging. Sorry to cut you off, but let's go back into that thought there. Sure, no problem. So we have T cells and B cells, these adaptive immune cells are both considered lymphocytes. In the case of when you're aging, you're not being exposed to as many of these uh, pathogens in the environment. And so your, your immune cells eventually, when there's no thought of and there's no evidence of threat, then your immune system will wane. Plus, as you get older um, with a more sanitary lifestyle, you're, you may be exposed to whether stresses, these things can reduce your immune system. So I think with the elderly, they just need to exercise that immune system more and, and being more sequestered actually makes it harder for them to have a good robust immune system. If you're out there more active, you're likely even as you're older, have good immune protection. Good. Um, Dr. Carr, we, you just talked before break uh, about that study that says uh, if you, in Singapore, uh, was found that uh, last 17 years from SARS-1 infected patients who never previously had COVID-19, they actually had antibodies that were moving up. Would you explain that a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, um, so the virus has a a genome sequence that um, ends up producing proteins. And it's those proteins that act as antigens that uh, the immune system recognizes as foreign and mounts an immune response to. So if the protein signature is similar with SARS or any other coronavirus that causes maybe the common cold, for example, and SARS-CoV-2, then antibodies that were targeting what we call an epitope on the um, any one of those proteins um, can cross react. And so you get some level of protection. So in the case of this, we'd be talking, uh, an example would be the spike protein, for example, the spike protein is similar to uh, SARS and SARS-CoV-2. So your antibodies would cross react with those. Uh, and some of the other yeah. so actually, go I ahead, Steve. In my own lab, we've <clears throat> actually uh, created sequences that are from SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. And some of the people we test today, we can see that they actually have antibodies that recognize SARS-CoV-1, but not SARS-CoV-2 as well. So that illustrates a, a natural immunity that's persisted for at least 17 years since that virus has, has been known to be around. And the, But at the same time, we do see very strong cross-reactivities in, in some parts of the virus proteins where likely the antibodies they developed against cold coronaviruses, for example, or maybe SARS-CoV-1, actually are still there and they protect people today from SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. Very good. Um, so let's, let's move into uh, natural immunity and COVID-19. We have been touching, we just sort of touched on it there. I mean, I guess that's the question now. If we recognize natural immunity and other things, uh, that we should be re recognizing natural immunity when it comes to COVID-19. We, we've only got about a minute left uh, to discuss this, but we're gonna, we'll are gonna we pick it up for the next, uh, the next show as well. But could we just get started here with uh, why it's important we look at natural immunity as it relates to COVID-19? 
Do you want to take that one, Dr. Paul? Uh, sure. Well, okay. both Neil and, and myself, we've been involved in uh, going through the literature very carefully, uh, along with our colleagues at the Canadian COVID Care Alliance. And basically, it, natural immunity is, is better because in the case of the vaccine-induced immunity, it's against just one of the 28 proteins. So it's a very narrow immunity. Secondly, we know that we have lasting immunity with natural immunity. Uh, we've demonstrated in our own lab, we've tested people a year and a half after they've been infected and we can still clearly detect their antibodies. And, and, and third, it's the right type of antibody. When you're infected with a virus that goes through into your lungs and airway spaces, the response of those kind of antibodies tend to be what we call IgA and IgM class antibodies. But when you're vaccinated, the type of antibody that you get is an IgG class antibody. They're very good. They last for at least 21 days. But the levels of those IgG antibodies in your airway spaces and lungs is very low. And so your protection is not as complete. Whereas when you've naturally been infected and you have that response of the IgA and the IgM antibodies, they're there and they will be produced at those sites by, by memory um, B cells that are located there. And then finally, you can avoid the issues of vaccine injury, which is another topic entirely. Which, and you know what? We'll, we'll catch that on the next, next show. So we've got a really good show here. We're going to um, do a, a second part here as we look at natural immunity and COVID-19 and how it relates to individuals.